of life. Well, recently I've been assessing my life and I've been thinking of writing a book, a children's book. But what does it take to put pen to paper in the way that JK Rowling and countless others must have done to produce a work that'll be loved not only by your children, but by your children's children? Some books for little ones and not so little ones have been around for generations. And yet there's often a common theme running through them. Hero overcoming adversity and evil distractions to win out in the end. You get me drift. So what makes a children's book different these days? Well, perhaps you quite fancy yourself as a writer too. But how do we get started? Just what do we do to, to get our ideas out of our heads and into the bookshops, as it were? Well, last week I went along to the Guy Lawley Library to find out. What does it take to write a children's book? Well, I've come to the Guy Lawley Library to find out. I've braved the rain and the fact that the only coat I could find in my car is covered in dog hair. So goodness only knows what I look like. So I've come here to the Guy Lawley Library to meet some children's authors to find out what it takes to put pen to paper or to put fingers on a keyboard to pen a children's book. What captures the imagination of children? It's a tough call, isn't it? And as I come through here, the entrance hall of the Guy Lawley Library, I can see a Dalek which is starting to get my imagination working overtime. Well, so I'm going to run away from the Dalek now and take the lift up to the third floor where I think we might meet three children's authors who are visiting Guernsey. Now, I happen to know that one of them has already been around my son's school and a jolly good job he must have done because my son was enchanted by all that this author had to say. So let's find out exactly what it means to be a children's author and perhaps this will provide us with inspiration to write our own children's work that maybe could be turned into a film. Perhaps this could be a way that I could make my millions like JK Rowling did. I think that's in the back of all of our minds, isn't it? And I've just caught sight of myself in the mirror and I look a complete picture. Actually, I could be the character of a children's book, but in a more frightening way. Floor three. Is the lift stuck? Oh, goodness, there's a slight pause. Hello. And I think in here we'll find some children's authors. Hello. Hello there, I'm Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello lovely to meet you. Hi. Hello. I'm Jenny from BBC Radio Guernsey, and I think, uh, pleased to meet you. Pleased to, oh, pleased to meet you, and I must already look like a children's character in a monsterial kind of way, because I realise the only coat that I've got in the back of my car is covered with dog's hair. <laughs> I've been caught in the pouring rain, so I've come to find out what it takes to write a children's book. Are you ready for me? Absolutely, I'm always. Okay. <laughs> Introduce yourselves, please. My name's Nick Cook, and I have written a, a trilogy called Cloud Riders. And you must be? I am Tommy Dumbervand. Uh, I've written lots of books, but most people know me for my Scream Street series, which is now on TV as well, so it's very exciting. You happened to go to my son's school yesterday, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, I oh. said, William, did you have a good day? Yes, we had Tommy Dumbervand at school. Mm. And uh, I'm just going to come and talk no. to you first of all, because you're holding a picture of something that I'm incredibly scared of. Do you mind if I remove my jacket which is incredibly hairy in fact i could be the gruffalo couldn't i absolutely yes no you're not supposed to agree with that no i, I, I did that and yeah, yeah, yeah. um, no we had um a fantastic day in all the schools and i got i came over a little bit earlier to uh, come into the library on saturday to a big doctor who day uh, which was fantastic we had daleks and cybermen and uh, but and, and and boys and girls coming in dressed as the doctor as well which was fantastic Lots and lots of costumes. Because for me, the Dalek is possibly the scariest image from my childhood, but why is that? Because they are unstoppable. You absolutely can't reason with them. It's probably the only Doctor Who villain that can't be spoken to. But you could happen. reason with them. They were stoppable because they didn't used to be able to go upstairs, they but in the new do. episode they do, and it's just too freaky for words, isn't it? It is a little bit, especially now they can yeah, more or less fly. So, Stop it, Tom. No, they can fly. They can fly in the series now. So I have to hold my hand in my dreams. <laughs> I know they're a fantastic villain, and um, if I ever got the chance to write a ch chance to write a, a Dalek story, I'd absolutely jump at it. So tell us about your books for the uninitiated, would you? My books are all um, vampires, werewolves, gory uh, scares. Um, basically, I, when I first started out, I thought I would be writing them for boys primarily because I know the boys like all like um, gore and. Um, scary stuff, but I get more emails and letters from girls than I do from boys. Now, whether that's because girls are more likely 
to finish a book and contact the author, who knows? It's just a fantastic, a fantastic series that I enjoyed writing so much, and now it's been made into a stop motion animated TV series on CBBC, and it's it's taken on a whole new life. How did you get into writing for children in the first place? Uh, I didn't grow up. It's pretty much as simple as that. I write the books that I would like to read, um, and the books that I would love to have had when I was when I was that age. And it's for that reason that I can come up with um, party animals, zombies, and farting goblins. You've got a few of those in Guernsey. I've noticed, yeah, yeah. as I've been travelling around. You've been to a states meeting. <laughs> Not quite. So, what were you doing before you became a children's author? Even more precariously, I was an actor. Um, I was an actor for, in children's theatre for a while and then I was in a musical in London all about Buddy Holly for eight years. Where did you train as an actor? Um, I trained at quite a small drama school in Blackpool. I did all my training in Blackpool and then um, immediately, um, with my ambition to become a serious straight actor, um, got a job as a clown um, called Wobble Bottom. At least you didn't get a job as the Oodle Noodle Man in an advert, which is usually the case for actors. That's isn't normally it? the case. I did do, I did do an advert. I did a butter kissed popcorn advert where they threw popcorn at me, and that was about it. Surely your experiences within children's theatre must have given you so much material for writing children's books. Well, there's no really, there's, you know, there's no, there's no, no better place to come up with zombie uh, stories than uh, working in schools. And Nick Cook, I'm just going to go over to you if we could yeah. juggle places a moment. Tell us about your Cloud Riders series because I suspect lots of people have heard of that too. Cloud Riders is a, a, a series of books I've set in Tornado Alley in North America. Why Tornado Alley? because that's where you get all the biggest tornadoes in the world. It's um, a book which really draws upon all sorts of experiences that I've had through my, my own life. In some ways, I guess I tap into even things like growing up during the space race and those moon landings, that sort of sense of wonder about, you know, uh, of exploration. And then I actually used to work for over 20 years in computer games. So I worked as an art director and artist and I had all sorts of incredible experiences through those 20 years. Which computer games did you work on? Over 40 at least. So um, now I got out of computer games 10 years ago. So, Any famous ones? Uh, the ones that I probably would remember recently would have been uh, the Conflict Desert Storm series. Um, going back, for the people who know their games, they may remember XCOM, for example, which is a very well and very known game, very well loved. Actually, some people in the library service here say, oh, I remember that game. And it, what's very funny is I, my career started in the mid-80s when the computer games were just getting going. And I sort of fell into computer games at that point. And my first UK number one was a, a game called Enduro Racer. And a number of times I have done workshops and teachers said, I had that game. I remember it. Like practically they're asking for a signature at the end, so it's, it's lovely to have that sort of, you know, to draw upon. Because it does date you. I mean, my son's nine, yes. and he can't believe that I still remember the first day I saw my first ever internet page, and I mean, he thinks I'm something out of the art. Absolutely. It's very, very hard for this, this sort of, you know, current generation to appreciate the internet hasn't been around forever. And when I showed them the slide of the first home computers, and we're only talking the mid-80s here, we're not talking 3,000 years ago. And they get, you might they, as well be. Yeah, I'll be, I might as well be. <laughs> and it's really, really funny. But all of that, you see, is, is drawn. I draw upon all those experiences, including I learned to fly. I, I've, I've flown like aircraft and micro lights and things. And all that experiences, in many ways, is what I've drawn upon when I became a full-time writer 10 years ago. As I warn the students during the workshops, if they love their writing, it's like having this little voice at the back of your head which will nag you your whole life until you really take it seriously. It won't leave you alone if you love writing. Well, I'm glad you said that because I remember absolutely adoring writing when I was at school and I had a friend who I'm still trying to track actually because she went back to the north of England. She was called Nicola Cooper and we used to have writing competitions oh. And that voice has never left me. So when I interview authors such as yes. your good selves, I'm thinking, come on, Jen, why aren't you writing your own book? It's, I think there's a moment, if you're lucky enough, you get to a moment in your life where you can make that decision. And I, that for me, that moment came up 10 years ago. But I tell you, when you face that decision and think, right, I can actually get, do this now, become a full-time writer. It, most people do it sensibly. They have another job and they write. I didn't. I really went for it. I, I gave up everything to become a full-time writer. Wasn't that a bit stupid? Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but that's the right way I roll. Um, but of course, it's otherwise. I, I knew if I didn't, I would have forever after that looked at that moment in my life thinking, why didn't you do it? Are you a Scorpio? Yes. 
oh my word, I've never done that before. I thought I'd sound really, sound really knowledgeable. Hello, I was, oh. when's your birthday? Uh, 19th November. 10th of November. Oh, wow. Well, driven. We're an all or nothing type of we person, are. aren't we? We so are. So we can't have the peripheral <laughs> nonsense of a secondary job. Oh, I've, I've honestly never done that before. That's that freaked me out. I've become Mystic Meg and I thought I was coming to be a children's author. Now we've got Steve Anthony in the corner here. He wasn't here when I arrived, but he's arrived now with an array of his books, The Queen's Hat, Please Mr Panda. Hi there, nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. Tell me about you and why you became an author. Okay, well I've always wanted to become an author illustrator. Uh, I've always enjoyed telling stories through images. And yeah, for a very long time since I was very, very young. Um, it wasn't until recently that I had the opportunity to, to really sort of dive in head first. Are you a Scorpio as well? No. Capricorn. <laughs> I'm a Taurus. Yeah. I'm not good at this, no. <laughs> Taurus. Yeah, but you are wearing a very fluorescent jacket, which gives me the impression that you are arty. Oh uh, yeah, you could say that. I'm quite, oh, yeah, I do dress a bit arty, I guess. <laughs> did you go to art college? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I graduated um, in 2013. Uh, from the Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, and it was a, a master's degree in children's book illustration that oh, I did. Oh, wow. So you were thinking of illustrating the books. You, did you have any plans at that stage to, to write them? Uh, yeah, I think, I, well, actually, uh, it's, it's, that's an interesting question, because one of my books, The Queen's Hat, which was the first book that um, was published, um, I first uh, did this book with no words whatsoever. It was just the images. It was just the images. It was part of a, a project for university where we had to create a story that had no words. So you could tell what was happening just from the images. And then I found that it really added to the story to, to, to add in the words. For example, in this book, we see different famous landmarks. So it made sense to put in the names of those landmarks. Um, so it then becomes more of an educational tool, as well as, well as a very fun book full of visual humour. And in actual fact, um, I mentioned that it was an, an MA course that, that I was on. I, I was on, only able to start that course because I was made redundant from a call centre. I was working in a call centre for almost nine years. And, um, and in 2010, I was made redundant. So with that money, I was able to really take a leap of, fa leap of faith, really, I think it was. You did what's uh, commonly been become known as a Nick Cook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in these parts in the last 10 minutes or so. What was your degree in originally? Uh, it was in illustration, originally in illustration. Where did you do that? That was in Swindon, which is where I live. Now, Steve Anthony, one of the three authors I spoke to last week at the Gilloyle Library. So now we have a good idea of what makes up the DNA of three already published and highly successful children's authors, Tommy Donbevand, Nick Cook and Steve Anthony. But I suppose it's the hinterland, if you will, that we now have an awareness of. Well, stay with us as we find out what we need to do to produce a work of our own and, if it's possible, to make a decent living as a writer just in case you have any ideas. More from Tommy Donbevan, Nick Cook and Steve Anthony in just a few minutes after this. A warm welcome to BBC Radio Guernsey. If you've just joined us, hello. We're discovering what it takes to be a children's author, just in case you think you could be the next JK Rowling. I've certainly been toying with the idea of extracting a book from myself, and so I went along to the Guy Lawley Library the other day to meet three hugely successful authors for children and young people, Tommy Donbevan, Nick Cook and Steve Anthony, who joined me along with Elizabeth Hutchinson, who's the head of Guernsey's Children's Library Service. Here's part two of our mini writing masterclass, so pay attention, do, and take copious notes, as you never know, it could make you your fortune. Or could it? So we've got a good idea as to what makes, uh, makes up the, the DNA of a children's author, if you will. But what does it take to be a children's author? Can you start giving advice now to anyone on the other side of this radio who wants to do exactly what you do? And actually, I don't really care about them because I've, I've come along to find out for me because I've actually always wanted to write a children's book. So you can join me, the other side of this radio, if you want to. And maybe we can all be JK Rowling the third or the second because there are lots of wannabes. Um, and actually, it's it's a supercar I'm after buying. So first of all, is there money in, in writing? Uh, when you get to the JK Rowling level, then, then, then there is. But uh, we try and eke out a living, don't we, guys? Uh, yeah. Um, it's not, it's, if you go into children's books to make money, there are far easier ways of making money. But that's the point now, everybody's going into it to yeah. be the next J.K. Rowling, aren't they, do you think? I, I think 
if they are, that's the wrong reason to become a writer. You, you need to become a writer because it is in your DNA. It is who you are. You are desperate to release the story from the center of your soul. And if you have that driving sort of desire, it will take you everywhere. And as I say to the students, I actually talk about this and follow your dreams sort of talk I do at start my my workshops, you know, you know, follow your follow your passion in life. And if for you that passion is writing, do it. Grab it. Read as much as you can and, and write as much as you can. Although I will tell you this one interesting fact I did hear about this. I once I, I once read that you need to get out of your system about a million words or down to the page before you get any good. Well, maybe I should write my version of Fifty Shades of Grey first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously for adults. Um, the point of this exercise really is to find out if we, the listener and, and the presenter, have it in ourselves to, to write a, a children's book. And it's not as easy as you think. The problem I find, and I was thinking about it as I was driving up here, is that there are only so many permutations of evil character being overcome by, by good character, heroes, castles, witchery schools, wizard colleges, that, that you can come up with without... It's almost like a scale of eight notes for, for a songwriter, isn't it? Without um, coming up against something that's already been done before, even unwittingly. I think you just have to ignore all of what's been done before, actually. And you just have to go with what, what feels right for you. And there's inspiration all around us. And lots of my books just come from things, random things, that inspired me. For example, The Queen's Hat, which is a book about the Queen chasing her hat all over London, was inspired simply by a newspaper article. If I hadn't seen that article, the book wouldn't exist. And uh, Please Mr Panda, which is my other book, which is, uh, which is about um, a panda that won't give away his donuts because none of his friends are saying please, that was inspired just by a, a, an image that kept coming up in my sketchbook. I kept drawing pandas. I had this obsession with pandas for a while. Do and you I, need to talk about that a more? <laughs> I probably do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, and donuts too, that's also a problem. So yeah, I thought, okay, this is a great character. And this character, the more I drew him, became grumpier and grumpier. And uh, I love the fact that it didn't really fit the stereotypical cute, cuddly panda that we're also used to seeing. So I really went with that, and uh, the more I explored this character, uh, the story sort of naturally evolved. So you just have to start with your gut feeling rather than be too, too aware of what's already happening, you know, what's already out there. Can I ask you for some help now, please? I wondered if you could help me write my first story. Mm -hmm. And of course I'll share the rights when it becomes made of, mm -hmm. into a film. Uh, but yesterday, um, after I picked William up from school and he'd met you, Tommy, mm -hmm. and been enchanted by all that you had to say, I got a bit creative, but we had a radiator in the, in the boot of our car that I needed to take to the dump. So I drove into this muddy dump and uh, there were potholes everywhere and the car was clattering and clanging along. Blokes in overalls met me and said, it's number three, dump it over there, love. So that's what I did and I lifted the radiator. They didn't offer to help, thanks guys. So I lifted the radiator, rather heavy it was, into the, the dump and then I got into the car and I, I suddenly realised that everyone goes through a sense of grief however small, mm -hmm. when they say goodbye to something. And I said to William, the radiator's there on its own in the cold. And it might breed with a kettle so you'd get a radiator or a, 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 a kettleator or something like that. And then my mind went into overdrive and I thought maybe you could actually write a story about an abandoned radiator coming to life on a tip. And then I thought, oh, hang on a minute, you're being influenced by a book you remember from your childhood called Cecil the Superior Safety Pin. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought you were going to say Stig of the Dump then, I thought, because that's, that's the only one I remember. No. Cecil, the superior safety pin, had a, a marked effect on my development in the future, as you can see, obviously. So, how do we develop that story about the radiator? Well, first of all, you've got to try and work out what kind of personality this radiator's got. Radiators, I've, I've, I've always, they're, they're, they're almost like, uh, they can blow hot and cold, can't they? They're, they're, I hesitate to say bipolar, but um, yeah. The, the thing was about that situation was that it was me going off into flights of fancy and my son saying, oh, for goodness sake, mum, get over it. It's a piece of metal. So he was almost being the adult it's in that situation. It's not a piece of metal. It's been in your house. It's seen things, well, it's seen things, but it's witnessed things that have happened in your house. It's been part of your family for however long and you just ripped it from the wall and threw it away. How could you? Tommy, can you try and make me feel good about the situation? Because okay, I was okay. feeling pretty bad about if it. If, if, you know, 
thank you know and when you have i mean these are living things <laughs> don't forget you have to bleed a radiator these are these oh, are goodness, living yeah, it's making it worse isn't it <laughs> yeah um with any luck then the other um, pieces of scrap took it in and looked after it and maybe they're forming a giant massive uh sort of transformer style robot to come back and reap their revenge as we speak thank you for that yeah, yeah. yeah. um in terms of that particular story where would you have taken it well, actually, I think the, the stories that seem the most bizarre, the most obscure, and the most random yeah. are the best ones to explore because there's a challenge. There's a, ch there's a challenge there. So you have a radiator. So what's the radiator's name? And like Tommy was saying, you know, what's the personality of the radiator? And isn't it weird that, you, that a, ra a radiator could have a personality? That in itself is it did. really interesting. That's a really quite amusing um, concept. So what, where does the, what world does this radiator reside in? Who are the radiator's friends? Who are the radiator's enemies? What's the radiator's purpose in life? You know, what's his calling in life? There's, and it sounds crazy, but the more you start thinking of those questions, the more, you know, you get ideas. And some of the ideas seem absurd, really silly, but you're having fun with it, and that's the whole point. And actually, we've picked something at random, but I've done a songwriting workshop, and that's exactly the same thing. You go along... You're going along the street, somebody might say something, oh, look at that old lady Eleanor Rigby, and, and before you know it, you know, um, going back to the eight notes of the scale. Where would you have taken this, Nick? I think we're almost in sort of Toy Story territory here. And think about what they did there, something very similar. They thought about the backstory, Woody, you know, his most, most popular toy in the, in the sort of like um, your bedroom. So what's the backstory of your radiator? You now, where's it come from? And then what you have to do with your characters when you send them off on the journey, you have to think of something truly, truly dreadful that you're going to do to the character. So maybe being melted down. William said, Mum, just get over it. It's a, a, a radiator. I said, but it's going to be cold. It's a really cold night, William. And he started to giggle and he said, oh, for goodness sake, Mother. He said, it's going to be crushed. You didn't tell me it was going to be crushed. So maybe that the crushing could... Yes turn it into a, a beautiful, I don't know, bejeweled goblet or something. <gasps> Which ends up back in your house. And Dang. gives me magic powers. And oh. all of a sudden, Daniel Craig comes into my life and whisks me off my feet. Yeah, that would work. That would work. <laughs> that, that would, that I can definitely see that happening. Yes. Yeah. The new, the new Bond played by a radiator. Yes. Yeah. Similar sort of expression range to Roger Moore. <laughs> but what sort of car would it drive? So can I just say I'm going to look out for this book now in the future. If I mm -hmm. see a radiator book in, you know, on, on the shelves, I'm going to, it'll be yours, you know. And maybe in a few years' time there could be a movie, a trilogy about this radiator. You know, I said I was going to share the rights with you boys. <laughs> um, I might invite you round for a, a glass or two of champagne from Jenny's magic fired up goblet <laughs> and my jewel encrusted radiator while I park my Aston Martin outside. Elizabeth Hutchinson, you are the school's head of the school's library service. What does it mean to you to have authors like this in Guernsey? Uh, it's really important. With, without the inspiration of, of people like Nick, uh, Steve and... Um, Tommy, oh. um, <laughs> sorry, um, it, it's, um, it, it just it allows us and helps us to be able to sort of interact with the kids even more and, and inspire them to read. Reading for Pleasure is huge and it's part of what we do to help with that process. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of, of the gathering here. I'm going to come back to you gentlemen now, if I may, please, and ask you what it's been like going around Guernsey schools and meeting some of our children. And do they differ from those little ones on the UK mainland that you meet? They don't, really. Um, school classes are school classes normally wherever you go. And just such, I'm having a great time. I know, I know the, the other guys are as well. There's such a, a warm atmosphere wherever we go. Each of the schools we go into everybody's looking forward to the event and that is a big thing that's a big thing where they've been looking forward to they've been maybe looking you up on the website and having a look at one or two of your books um so i know from my point of view i'm having a fantastic time does it help having a bit of an acting background when you're presenting to a large hall of children it does it does um i like to go in and wind everybody up to the point of hysteria and then leave but it's been fantastic just to to, to meet so many pupils um, who are just enthusiastic about reading and know so many books and so many authors, and that's great. Oh, it's just been such a great experience. You know, I felt honoured to have been invited to, be, to take part in this in, the, in Children's Book Week here in Guernsey. So I've visited six schools, I think, so far. I think it's six, or is it? 
I've lost count, maybe it's nine, I'm not too sure. Um, but it's been such a great experience. The teachers have, have, have been so welcoming and friendly, as, and the librarians have been so helpful. And the, the pupils are very well prepped, you know, they've read the books, they know about the characters, they, they want to talk about the characters, they're engaged with the characters, some of them, some of them really are quite invested in the characters, which is really great mm -hmm. to see, it's very inspiring, so it's, it's rewarding to see this. I like to think they've gone away inspired. Absolutely fantastic, and so I've been into the secondary schools, okay. I do also work in the primary schools as well, but it's so interesting the way that the dynamic starts to shift with the older students, uh, but they have been absolutely fantastic, and I'll give you an example from yesterday, I'd sort of I finished uh, doing the, uh, the workshop and the talk and we were about to leave in the car and this, this student comes rushing out to the car and knocks on the window and says, oh, I, I need to contact you, that, that was amazing. You know, and I, so I give him the card and he, he sent me through several chapters from a book he's working on. And that's sort of why we're here, you know. If we can inspire just one student, several students, 100 students, 200, 300, whatever, this is why that, that weeks like this are so important because it's about inspiring this new generation. What sort of books did you read when you were a child? Well, this is another thing I say to students. Back in the mists of time when I was a child, we had a fraction of the books that they had today mm. to read. And in fact, it's my older sister really switched me on to writing. One Christmas, I found under the tree a copy of Lord of the Rings. And I was only about 12, and that book transformed my life. Because I, I got to that, and I really did start writing my first book at the age of 12. And I got all the way to page 10, and then I gave up. But it was enough to have lit that spark, that love of writing. And that's why we're here, I hope, to just do the same thing. Pass on that baton of creativity to the next generation. See, I was Enid Blyton, and I never did get to go to boarding school. Oh, I, I mean, see. just that was just so such a disappointment <laughs> to me. I also remember a lovely little book called Mary Anning's Treasures, which was about fossil hunting in Lyme Regis oh. as well, which was was beautiful. And Nicholas Fisk's Antigrav, which might be uh, closer to, to your yeah, style of writing. Yeah. Uh, what about you? Books that inspired you, Steve, when you were younger? Well, I mean, I've always loved picture books, collecting picture books. When I was really young, it was the Mr. Men books, um, books by Raymond Briggs, as Ezra Jack Keats, who's an American author illustrator. Um, but I really struggled, actually, to, to sort of make that transition from picture books to chapter books. And I found that, well, I, I found that it was a lot easier for me to, uh, to, to start reading sort of more adult books, I suppose we could say, um, by, by reading more of the more heavily illustrated books and even comic books and then graphic novels and I think it's okay it's okay if a child struggles to read you just have to find the right book it doesn't matter if it's still a picture book or if it's you know a comic book everyone finds their own style of books I started out with Roald Dahl and Enid Blyton um, but Enid Blyton they were fantastic stories but as a kid Growing up in Liverpool, they, they were about as far away as from my life as I could possibly I was imagine. Good, but so I can't really see you in a school school pinafore wearing um, a hat and playing lacrosse. To be honest, we never had lashings of ginger beer. It was it wasn't <laughs> fair. But eventually, you keep reading. This is what I was explaining to the pupils uh, in, in the visits I've done so far this week. Is that one day you will find the book that speaks to you, and that will be the one that turns your reading habits into you know in, down this road or that road. Whether you go. I grew up to love sci-fi or horror, um, and as Nick was saying, we didn't have those kinds of books. I basically went from Roald Dahl to reading James Herbert and Stephen King because there wasn't anything in between. Having met you, that explains a lot. It does, it does. I was reading horror far too young, ah. and it, uh, it absolutely left its mark on me. I hesitate to say this because I don't want to be derogatory about my beautiful island, but whenever I get off the island to go to Gatwick and I'm waiting for the Gatwick Express, I think that I've landed on what I call platform nine and three quarters because <laughs> it is a bit Harry Potter-esque this island sometimes uh, don't mention the politics Jenny um, yeah. sometimes in terms of the way the government's run things that people say you know it's, it's all a bit Harry Potter however it, it's about beautiful scenery Renoir painted here um, there was the Sark School of Art with Mervyn Peake writing on Sark and he wrote Gormenghast based on the craggy cliffs of Sark and things like that yeah. you didn't know that I know I've been to Sark yeah um, and in fact, if you remember the BBC series with Sir Derek Jacobi, all those craggy cliffs, and you, you then look at Sark, he brought over the, um, a, a, some artists from London and set up a Sark School of Art, so something else for you to investigate when you return, and we hope you do. But of all that you've seen so far in Guernsey, 
Is there a nugget that you're going to take back and work into a book? Do you think you're nodding, Tommy? Absolutely. I, I'm so ashamed. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, I've been working um, over the past few days with uh, a fantastic guy called Alan Nell from the Schools Library Service. And he knows an awful lot about Guernsey and its history. And over our lunchtime today, I found myself standing inside a burial mound near one of the schools. And that was just... that would be the... Day of Storm and all the day he um, near Vale School, probably. Yeah. Could well be, yeah, it was near the Vale School, and so that is definitely going into a book um, as soon as I get home. It was amazing. Well, make sure you give BBC Radio Guernsey first dibs on publicity, please. I'll certainly help you with that. Absolutely. Thank you. What about you, Steve? Well, I really want to put the Golden Guernsey into a book. Oh, yeah. yes, please, because it's an endangered species. I know, I know, and this is this is why it's important. And uh, I didn't know about the Golden Guernsey until coming here, so it's a, you know, I've learned about this. this this type of goat. Have you not uh, tasted chili billy since you've been here? No, no, what's chili? What's they chili? look scared, my love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, chili billy is a goat's cheese made from the milk of a golden Guernsey goat oh. and it's mixed with chili and it's absolutely okay, gorgeous. That's going to be my little souvenir. I'm taking that back. Yeah, it won't last, won't last very long though. And what about you, Nick? <laughs> well, no, I, one of the big themes in Cloud Ride is, is weather. And it, I am so impressed that library services, especially for my arrival, arranged the amazing weather that we've been having since the weekend. Did you come over on boat? Uh, no, I landed. Oh, that looks like <laughs> <it. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> But the thing is, I'm one of those people, because I, I, I use to fly. So as a pilot's doing some very, very impressive bit of flying as he's coming in, dealing with that weather that, we, that, was, that was happening on Sunday night. Uh, oh my word, you flew in on Sunday? Yes, I did. So I'm probably one of the few passengers not screaming at that point as he comes in on one way or whatever. But that's great, you see. But I love elemental weather. Mm. I write about this. This, this is what like, gets my creative juices flowing. And so when I was doing a workshop on the Monday with incredible views of your spectacular landscape, I'm absorbing that. That's all going to go into our various books. Fantastic. So some Guernsey-based stories coming out. And, of course, this was the island on which Les Miserables was written or completed. Did you know that? Really know? Yes. Know that. Have you been to Victor Hugo's house since you've been over? No, I haven't. No. It's, oh, you've got to go. You're going to have to get back, Elizabeth. These authors are going to be far too busy. <laughs> Please. They work very, very hard. Please make a point to come over to do a research trip, each of you, in the summer, and to make a point to go and see Victor Hugo's house. That in itself will give you inspiration to write another story. There's even a chair for the ghosts of his ancestors with a chain across it. It's just fantastic. So, uh, yeah, lots of inspiration there. I hope for you guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Guernsey. And thank you so much for talking to BBC Radio Guernsey. And thank you for giving me inspiration about the new bestseller, sorry to saturate the market, um, about the story of the little radiator that was abandoned at the tip in Jersey. Shades of Fifty Shades of Valves. You're getting mucky now. <laughs> right, where did I put my coat? It's still covered in dog hair, but I'm filled with inspiration. Gentlemen and Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.